Hello. Welcome to the Business Council of Westchester Member Spotlight. The BCW is the county's largest and most diverse business membership organization with 1,100 current members. I am Linda Tyler, Vice President of Membership and Programs and your host today. Our conversation is going to focus on exploring the transformative power of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and just as important, belonging, and what that means for organizations and businesses across all industry sectors and sizes. We can't wait to get started. I would like to welcome our guest today, Valerie Mason Cunningham, co-founder and co-CEO of Mason Rice, LLC. Valerie's story is one of unwavering dedication, strategic foresight, and deep-seated commitment to fostering inclusivity and belonging while creating high-performing environments. Her legacy is not just in the businesses she has transformed, but also in the lives she has touched and the communities she has empowered. Melissa Andro Esquire is an experienced litigator who leverages her background in law to lead Dorf, Nelson, and Zouderer LLP's diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives, as well as chief diversity officer. Melissa is a former prosecutor and a BCW ambassador. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Ladies, let's talk for a moment about two additional and equally important components to DEI accessibility, and belonging. Please elaborate more regarding what these very significant components mean and how they impact DEI. Who would like to start? Well, I'll go first. And thank you for that question, Linda, because it is very important to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And accessibility is really focused around the opportunity to allow those who have disabilities to have equal and accessibility to their work environments. So things like physical barriers, where you have stairs but no ramps, or digital barriers, where you have websites but you don't have accessibility for the pop-ups of words for people who need to see the words but don't necessarily have all of their eyesight in order to see some of the things that are happening on the website. And the other thing is, is for, you know, barriers around perception. So biases around someone who is disabled when you visibly can see them can sometimes hinder those people from really being the best that they can be. So accessibility is something that is a human right for everybody. It is not something that should be looked at as a barrier because they don't have all the abilities like someone else, but they may have so much more. And you could be missing out on talent by taking a blind eye to not allowing those people to be a part of the environment. Belonging actually is very, you know, similar to inclusion. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not really sure what the difference is between inclusion and belonging. But there is a significant difference. Inclusion says you're at the table. But belonging says you're not only at the table, but I hear you, I see you, and I respect you. And that you can come as you are being your authentic self and being able to allow that creative voice and that innovation of collaboration to really come through. And there are a lot of statistics around companies who really foster a culture around belonging, like 56% job increase when people feel like they belong. I, I agree. And I think belonging is also saying we want you here. Absolutely. We want you here. And that's a basic human, I think, need. It you know, is. people want to feel like they belong, that they're a part of something. And Melissa, what would you like to add to that? So for me, the belonging aspect is very simple. It's whether I feel that I belong at a particular organization or a community. I look at it as the subjective um, not the objective, like how the person feels, how they're, how they go into their workplace. Do they feel that they can be themselves? Do they feel that they belong to the community at large? And that's how I view it. Pretty simple. How do I feel? Do I feel that I belong somewhere? 
And I love that the B, the belonging piece of the conversation is really wrapped up into D-E-I-A-B now. So I want to also talk a little bit about, Valerie, your personal journey and what motivated you to become an advocate for D-E-I-A and B. (laughs) Well, it, it started way back when my parents were actually part of the civil rights movement. And I was a part of that integration point of elementary school. And, you know, being a young kid, you don't really understand some of the issues that are around you when you're not being accepted for the way you look and the fact that you come from a different part of the community. But it definitely was affecting me through my parents. And so I started to notice that as I got older, how I was being treated. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even my teachers would tell me that, Because of who I was and where I had come from, I would never amount to anything. And those were false narratives. I am so sorry. That were being put into my mind. You experienced that. Thank God I had parents that understood you've got to step up. You've got to face the adversity that's in front of you because this too shall pass with that one person being there. So fast forward to my corporate experiences It was something that Xerox, who I worked for for 38 years, took into practice very early on in the 70s around making sure that there was balance in the workforce because the world was changing. And so employee resource groups that we talk about today, we had affinity groups back in the 80s and 90s of black employees, women, Hispanic employees, et cetera, we were probably one of the first Fortune 100 companies in America that actually had stepped up to do this type of work and to understand it as a business imperative, not just a program, a nice to do, check the box, but really it was a business imperative. So, and making it part of the company culture. Absolutely, and that's when I became an advocate obviously being a victim and then a victor uh, in the process and really striving to make sure everybody has at least the same level playing field in order to be successful. And thank you for the work you're doing. Thanks. Wow. Melissa, what role do you see leaders and companies playing in fostering an inclusive culture and how can they effectively model and support DEIAB principles? As a, be, as, a liter, uh, excuse me, as a business leader yourself, please share your perspectives. What can business leaders do? So first thing, there is no DEIBA or DEIAB without the leaders. Um, without them, we can't do anything with respect to DEI. So it is very important that they buy into it, that they believe it, that it's part of their core values. And some of the things that they need to do is they need to lead by example. They need to show the community, whether it's, you know, an organization or what what have you, that this is what they believe in, that it's important to them. And they need to lead by example. They need to establish clear values. What What does the organization stand for? What do you stand for? And that needs to be communicated to everyone so that they understand that DEIB is not just a checkbox. It's something that we work with, work on constantly. Um, it's constantly evolving. Um, it's not a one and done. So that needs to be communicated by the leaders on down. Um, the other thing is they need to have allow people to talk, open dialogue. Um, some people are afraid to voice, you know, their concerns that they're not, they don't feel included. And I, to me, if that's the situation, then that's leadership's fault. The leaders need to communicate, again, communication, that it's an open and safe space. You may not like what you hear, but in order for your employees and your people to feel safe and included, you have to hear the good and the bad. And lastly, I'll say as leaders, what we do and what we do at Dwarf Nelson is that you develop inclusive policies. Um, You know, if you've had policies that were 
good 10 years ago, they may not necessarily be good now. You have to constantly be evolving and reviewing to make sure that they are inclusive to everyone and that they do not exclude anyone. I think those principles make a lot of sense. And I was reading an article about DEI, and they also brought up the point which I thought was so valid, DEIAB should start the day a new employee starts at a company. It should be a part of the onboarding process so that it is just woven into the culture of the company. Right. Because the employee may be coming from an organization where DEI was not important or not, you know, talked about or... Mm -hmm. And then they come into, let's say, an organization like mine, we onboard them and we tell them, this is the culture of the firm. We take DEIBA seriously. It's not a checkbox. So it does start with the recruiting process. Day one. Day recruiting one. at the interview stage. Absolutely. Let them know that this is the organization they're coming into. I'd love that. Absolutely. And tell me, Valerie, how have recent global events and societal changes influenced the approach to DEIAB and business today? Yeah, that's a great question, Linda, because, you know, everybody is really focused in on DEI right now, especially since George Floyd's murder. But this has been going on since the civil rights movement. And the opportunity is that all we want is to make it an equal playing field for everyone to have access to the opportunities, no matter where you've come from or what you have experienced. As long as you have the talent, the will, and the grit and determination, you should be able to step in and do things. But with what has happened, since George Floyd, obviously people went a thousand percent overboard into checking boxes around DEI. And what has happened is, is it's really an unfair measurement of the real value that it brings when you harness the talent of different people from different walks of life. And it doesn't always have to be the visible things you see, like skin or, you know, the fact that you were wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. What's inside of the person is what they've experienced because the person has gone through something to get to something. And the only way you can acknowledge that is by communication, which is what Melissa talked about. Having communication and strong sit-down understanding of what the expectations are, what their values are, and how do we align to them. But a lot of the change is coming where people are feeling like it's not a value anymore, especially since last year's Supreme Court ruling of affirmative action. And people have really not thoroughly understood the value that it brings. Companies like what Melissa's company is doing and other companies that are embracing it still, they don't look at it as just a program. It is embedded, to your point, Linda, into the culture, and therefore it becomes a business imperative, whether you're in the for-profit space or the not-for-profit space, because through the products and services and opportunities that you bring, there's a talent war out here. So those individuals who want to work for a company that respects them, trusts them, wants to hear from them to create collaboration and innovation, that's where the talent's going to go. And what's interesting, if I could just share this one quick point, is sure. during COVID, which was interesting, we all had to really kind of understand a lot of things. That's when we found the digital gap. People weren't used to doing things on Zoom. People weren't used to, you know, what it means to be in front of a screen and have business etiquette in front of a business screen. So we all were learning from that. And then we shifted to go back to the office. And what happened was is those companies that forced five days a week started to lose very good talent. It was this whole thing around the, you know, everybody was quitting, However, those companies that embraced DEIAB, they were like chomping at the bit 
because they had so much talent coming to them because people wanted a place where they felt like they belonged. That, and they matter. Absolutely. And, and I think it also goes back to, you know, leaders are the role models. And, and it starts there and it just flows throughout the entire company, right? And I think that's what you're talking about at your firm. What you're doing, the great work you're doing is it starts at the top and how people behave and how they embrace their company culture and how they treat their colleagues, their workers, their clients, it it, it mushrooms in a beautiful way when it's done correctly. Does like, that make sense, what I'm yes. saying? Absolutely. And, you know, just to build on that one point, this is not necessarily an easy journey. It's not. It's hard. But anything that takes determination and grit is worth it at the end. Absolutely. What do they say? Anything worth having is worth working hard for. That's right. right? It's and that's okay. That's exactly. It's can, worth it. Can yes, I just add to that do. question? So, keeping it real, global events and circumstances have caused DEIAB to just become a bad word. It's like a curse word. It's gotten to the point where it's take been t the original intent of it to create equity and an even playing field for everyone has just been turned upside down. It's gotten to the point where people are saying that DEIAB is taking away from one group to give to another group. And it's that misunderstanding of the original intent that's mm -hmm. causing all of this strife and all these issues that we're having. If people would just really take a breather and listen and understand why DEI is necessary in the first place, we would all be better for it. Because if you don't, you lose talent, as Valerie was saying. You're missing out on opportunities. And I don't know why we want to go back to the way that we were before when, you know, it wasn't working. So let's embrace DEI. I would like for us to not have the need for DEI BA initiatives, really. But there's a reason behind it, and folks need to start understanding why it's necessary. And take a moment to educate themselves more about what it really means. Right. And I think that's I think that's key. And it, it this dovetails into my next question, which is, Melissa, in your opinion, what ways do you see the integration of DEIAB and multi generational workforces shaping the future of business? Because multi generational workforces are it's a really hot topic now in HR because so many companies, large and small, are working with so many different generations. And that's really interesting, but it's something that has to be managed a little bit. How does DEIAB fit into that? So, in the legal industry, in the legal industry, um, we benefit from having the older generation of attorneys. I mean, they are the source for the young associates, the young attorneys. If we didn't have a multi-generational, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Workforce. Workforce, we would lose out. The older generation would lose out because they wouldn't be speaking with the younger generation and learning what's in right now. And the younger generation would be losing out on, you know, what happened way back in the day, why something is what it is today. And I'll give an example. So at the firm, we have a 24-year-old um, legal assistant. I was speaking with him the other day, and I'm not that old, but speaking with him versus how I grew up is completely different. And he was educating me on things that are happening now, like the language that these kids are talking about, the, the technology that's in right now. If we didn't have, you know, the different age groups working at the firm, I would lose out on that. And he would lose out on my knowledge because he's going to law school. So I'm kind of like his mentor. So you, you would lose out on that if we just had one age group working at an, uh, at an organization. Do you if, think, I could, if I could just build on that, and, and I couldn't agree with Melissa Moore, it is a rich opportunity right now that we're sitting in, having five generations in a lot of companies and in a lot of industries. Some industries may be just four, but still, we've never had this before. And I just want to mm -hmm. run off some statistics really quickly. So traditionalists, which are 79-year-olds plus, they're, they're still working, some of them, but it's only 
When you look at baby boomers, and these are the folks between 78 and 60, it's 25% still in the workforce. When you look at Gen X's, which is between 15, you know, 44 and 59, they're 33% in the workforce. When you look at millennials, which is from 28 to 43, they represent 35% of the workforce. And Gen Z's, which are, you know, the 18 to 27 year olds, the people who can now come into the workforce, it's 5%. But what's important here is to understand something that Melissa basically said. The older generation has the knowledge and the wisdom, and you cannot not respect experience. But the younger generation is tech savvy. They're much more in tuned with fast pace and innovation and creativity. When you can harness all of it, it becomes magic. I love that, and I love the word magic, and you're absolutely right, because every generation, each generation, brings something really wonderful to the table, and when you weave it all together, it's almost like a family, right? You know, it can be quite beautiful, and we have barely scratched the surface. We have time for one parting thought from both of you. Where do you, I know, I know, I wish we could talk, (laughs) you know, for another hour, but where do you see DEIAB going? What can we do better and what can we do differently? One thought each. Well, from my perspective, it's respecting the fact that the demographics have changed. Our communities, our society has changed. And if we don't harness these incredible, talented human beings and have respect, we're losing our competitive advantage in the world. Very good point, and thank you. Melissa? Um, I, I see DEI, honestly, I see it staying. I don't see it going anywhere because I think the majority of you know, humans understand what it's about and they don't want to go backwards. Um, the people who have embraced it will continue to embrace it and will not let outside forces dictate what they do. Um, It's not only a business imperative, it's moral. Um, It's a good thing to do because we're all human beings and we need to live amongst each other. And the constant fighting is just not going to work. So I honestly see DEI continuing. The name may change, the acronym may change because you know what, it's going on. But I see the principles continuing. That's perfect. And thank you. And you're both right. It means so much to us that you shared today your wisdom, your experiences, your perspectives. I wish we could talk more. I think you have to come back in a few months and we'll continue this conversation. I would love to do it. Good, good. And a quick reminder to everyone listening, on November 5th, we have the opportunity as Americans to vote both at a county, a state, and a national level. And our voices, they're really in our vote. So please take a moment on November 5th Go to your local polling station and place your vote. Thank you both again for listening and for being a part of this big conversation and for sharing, sharing just a lot of thoughts and perspectives that we all need to take with us and continue, continue to embrace. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. (laughs) 